Hello, three-dimensional designers. Dal here, and this is a presentation on shape, space, and balance, three concepts that are going to be pretty important for you in your next project in this class. First off, we're going to begin talking about shape and space. Shape, in particular, is something that is relatively new to us in this class. It is one of our elements of art and design. So in other words, it's one of those building blocks that helps us put together a sculpture or a vase or any other kind of three-dimensional design object. Shape is one thing that most of us understand pretty intuitively. I mean, when I say, hey, what shape is that? Most of you probably aren't confused, but it's a little harder to define verbally. If you actually had to sit down and say, all right, the shape is dot, 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 that's a little more confusing. So let's talk about it. The easiest way to think of shape is to consider it as an enclosed space. In other words, anytime you block off some part of what you're making as an artist from what's around it, you've created a shape. So you're isolating things in some way. A shape can be enclosed in a bunch of different ways. So for example, it can be enclosed by a line. This is probably most familiar to us. Uh, we draw a line around something, an outline or a contour, in order to set whatever it is we want to be a particular shape off from the background. We did with, with this with Project 1, where we had wire maybe that we traced around um, the shape of our drawing that we created initially to get started with that sculpture. So line can be one way that encloses a shape. Another way a shape can be enclosed is by filling it in with value or color to set it off from the background around it. It can also be enclosed by creating a texture that sets the shape off apart from what surrounds it. So you see an example on the screen where the texture of this shape is different from the texture around it. Now it's important to know that in addition to shape being an enclosed space, it's also really crucial that shape is two-dimensional. You may remember when we talked about line with Project 1 that we talk about line being one-dimensional. It's mostly about length. Well, now we're adding that second dimension. Shape is about length times width. It does not, however, have any depth. It's just length times width. This means it's flat. Uh, so we sometimes say that shape is planar because it is part of a 2D surface or a plane. Now, as artists, it's important to know a little bit about some different categories of shape. We want to be able to intelligently talk about how shape is used both in artwork that we're looking at and also artwork that we're making. So you'll see some categories down here at the bottom of the slide, geometric, organic, rectilinear, curvilinear, objective, abstract, non-objective. These are all just sorts of groups of different ways of describing shapes. And I want to point out right at the start that there is some crossover between these categories. So you can have, for example, something that is geometric and curvilinear or something that is organic and objective. That's totally okay. There is crossover. So let's start out with geometric shape. This is one of the things that's probably most familiar to us, and when you think of a shape, you very likely think of something geometric. What something geometric has is that it is mathematically derived. Because of this, because it's based in math, it tends to be more regular and more ordered. Now, it may be rectilinear or curvilinear. It may also be objective, abstract, or non-objective. I know you don't know those terms yet, but again, there's crossover between these categories. Key thing you need to know about geometric shape, though, that is that it's mathematically derived. Some examples of sculpture that utilize geometric shape. Next up, we have organic shape. It's kind of considered to be the opposite of geometric shape. It is much more freeform, more natural and flowing. Uh, organic shape also may be rectilinear or curvilinear, and it may be objective, abstract, or non-objective. But again, the key here is that it's more of a freeform shape that's not necessarily, well, not necessarily, it isn't based in mathematics. So some examples of sculptures that use organic shapes. Human beings are organic shapes. We're kind of natural and free-flowing, at least in terms of our form. Um, here is a, an abstract organic shape, uh, which I would love to see this in person sometime. It's a um, sound sculpture that's out in the countryside in Great Britain. Next up, we have rectilinear versus curvilinear shape. Rectilinear is, I think, my least favorite word in art because it always sounds to me like some kind of horrible medical procedure that you don't want to have to have. But 
All it really means in art is that it's something made from straight lines. So anytime you have a shape that's mostly straight lines, it's rectilinear. Again, as with the other categories, there's crossover. You can have geometric rectilinear or organic rectilinear and objective abstract or non-objective. So some examples of sculpture that has mostly straight lines and is therefore rectilinear. And then we have curvilinear sh uh, shape, again, kind of the opposite of rectilinear shape. This is something that's made mostly from curved lines. Some examples, oh, the Venus of Willendorf, that's all curved lines, right? It's uh, a perfect example. Here we have some architecture, the Guggenheim in New York, mostly curved lines, curvilinear lines. And then final, this final category of sort of um, three parts is we have objective versus abstract versus non-objective shape. So when we talk about objective shape in this class, and this is something that will come up again and again over the semester, what we're talking about is that it matches observed reality. And in other words, we look at the shape and we're like, yeah, that looks like something. That looks like a cat or that looks like a car. It matches something that we see around us. So here we go. The Riace Warrior matches observed reality for the most part. I mean, I don't know anybody that has curls that are quite that fabulous but we can tell that this is meant to be a human being and it's fairly realistic. Jeff Koons' balloon dog, same thing. I know exactly what that is and I bet you do too. So it is considered to be an objective shape. Abstract shape uh, is a little different than objective shape. So abstract is a term that most of you probably associate with things like Jackson Pollock paintings where it's just a whole bunch of paint thrown at a canvas or you know big sculptures that are cubes and spheres and things like that but abstract is a little bit more nuanced than that all it really means is that there's some kind of alter alteration or stylization of observed reality so it could be completely paint splatters and geometric forms or it could be something that just looks a little bit different than we would expect observed reality to be so for example, this Kiki Smith sculpture, it is obviously a woman. Uh, however, her proportions are pretty extremely distorted. She's got this sort of strange curve to her. So she's been stylized or altered from reality and we can consider her an abstraction. Uh, this piece here, this was actually in the Coconino Study for the Arts in Flagstaff and it's based off mountain ranges. But obviously, I mean, they're just, they're a little bit distorted. They're a little bit simplified, floating in air. All of these things can uh, turn this into an abstract form or shape. And then last but not least, we have non-objective shape. This is something that does not match observed reality. In other words, it's not something recognizable from the real world. But non-objective is what most people mean when they say abstract. Now in this class, I'm not gonna like get on your case if you say abstract when you mean non-objective, but it's good as an art student to know the difference. So this is obviously a geometric non-objective shape. It's a spiral, um, but it doesn't match, you know, a, an object in the real world that we, we understand. And again, uh, one of these Alexander Calder installations, all of these are geometric shapes, but they don't match. They're not a hairbrush or a tractor or whatever else is in the real world that would constitute a recognizable shape. All right, so those are the categories of shapes. You'll want to know those so that you can talk intelligently about them in class. Another thing that we do need to talk about, as you may have heard me say when I was uh, uh, paging through those sculptures for you, uh, I would talk sometimes about shape and form. You know, I would say, oh, this is a geometric form. So I just want to point out that these are very closely related, but there is a difference here. So shape, remember, is two-dimensional, length times width. But when you add a third dimension, depth, your shape becomes form. And you should all remember form, right? Because we talked about that with project one. So what's really important about this is for project two, we're gonna to need to create form from shape. So we're gonna to have to go to three dimensions from two dimensions. We can build form from shapes in a whole number of different ways. And I'm gonna talk about some specifics right now. Remember this, because this will be important for your project two sculpture. So the first way you can create form from shape is to build the form by interlocking shapes on the surface of something. Essentially, you're creating facets on that surface, like you see on this little um, digital bear sculpture here. So you're skinning the surface in a way, but instead of skinning it with lines like we did for project one, you're creating interlocking shapes. That's one way to do it. 
The next way to do it is that you can take shapes and you can place them at angles to one another to establish a volume. So you see this sculpture on the screen that kind of looks like a melting waffle or something like that. This person has taken shapes at right angles to one another and how they come together establishes that form. The third way that you can do it is by laying shapes one on top of another like a stack of pancakes. I seem to have breakfast foods on the mind because waffles and then pancakes, but yeah, both of these ways will work pretty well to transform uh, shape into form. All right, before I move on to uh, balance, I just want to revisit the notion of space. Again, this is something we talked about during project one, how to compose something in space, but it's going to continue to be important for us throughout three-dimensional design. So we discussed space as being the area around or between the forms of a 3D sculpture or object. So you see the sculpture on the screen has a space all the way around the outside, but it also has spaces in between the legs, in between the arms, um, around the belly, and so forth. One of the most important things that you can do as a 3D artist and designer is engage the space around your art. So having something reach out into space, into the viewer's space, is a great way to get them activated, interested, involved. Uh, and again, one of the key ways to do this is by considering a relationship of positive and negative space. Again, we talked about this a little bit, but positive space is the actual physical volume of your 3D art, and the negative space is the area around your artwork. So having a relationship between those two, something that extends out into space and carves out an interesting shape or form in the in-between areas, that's really, really powerful and really, really engaging. I should point out that the arrangement of shapes and spaces also is really, really important to help creating something called visual balance, which, guess what? That's our, our third category here that we need to talk about. So let's dive into it. Visual balance, what the heck is that? Well, balance is one of these formal principles of art and design. So if you remember that shape and space and form, those are all elements, those building blocks, the things that we can actually build into a sculpture in order to create it. The principles are a little bit more nebulous. They're the way that we kind of evaluate how it's going. How did we put together these elements and is it successful? The uh, principles help us determine that. So balance is one of these. Specifically what it is, it refers to an even distribution of visual weight in a piece of artwork, in our case, in three-dimensional artwork. So you're trying to even out visual weight. Um, so basically what happens is in art, we imagine our compositions to be split across an implied either vertical or horizontal axis, usually vertical, but it can be both ways or one or the other. And we want to try to equalize the visual weight on one side or the other. And when I talk about visual weight, I'm kind of talking about just how heavy something feels. On the screen here, you see this white uh, rectangle split in half and there's like a heavy sort of diagonal square on one side and nothing on the other side. Well, that square, it pulls our eye and it has a visual gravity to it and that is visual weight. Uh, the blank side, the right side doesn't have anything on it, so it doesn't really have any visual weight. So we need to find a way when we're composing something to balance that visual weight on either side of our implied axis. But just so you're aware, four main types of balance in 3D art and design. Symmetrical balance, which is also known as formal balance, approximately symmetrical balance, asymmetrical or informal balance, and radial balance. So just want to show you these briefly. Symmetrical balance or formal balance is where you have the central axis and then a mirror image on either side. Uh, this is also called formal balance perhaps because it's more rigid and it is a very easy way to balance things because hey there's a mirror image on each side it's automatically equal weight but it can be a little bit static and boring if you're not very careful with it. Here are some examples of symmetry in three-dimensional art objects and design objects. Next up we have approximately symmetrical design this is something where you take the inherent balance of symmetry. So something appears at first glance to be identical on either side. And so you're taking advantage of that seemingly equalized visual weight, yet you're throwing in a little bit of a twist here. Something's just a little bit off from one side to the other, which adds in a little bit more visual interest. So in a sense, this is a mix of formal or symmetrical balance and informal or asymmetrical balance. Some examples of things that are approximately symmetrical. Incidentally, one of the most common, most common approximately symmetrical things out there is the human face. Most of us have a slightly different left and right side. 
Uh, so we're used to seeing this type of balance. Next up is asymmetrical or informal balance. This is going to be the one that's really important for us in our project. But with asymmetrical balance, the composition differs on either side of that implied access line. And so we as artists have to work to balance out the visual weight in ways other than just mirroring things. We don't have that built in equalized mirror. So we have to find other ways to even out the left and the right hand sides. Perhaps because this is a little bit more open-ended, it's also called informal balance. So some examples of, uh, in, uh, I'm sorry, asymmetrical balance in sculpture and design. And then last but not least, we have radial balance. This is where you have a center point and the composition radiates out from it, like spokes on the wheel. Radial balance is usually but not always symmetrical, so it's kind of related to some of our other types of balance, but you can see some examples of three-dimensional art and design that involve radial balance. All right, so the important thing here is that we have these different types of balance but at the end of the day, we have to have some strategies for using balance, for actually equalizing that visual weight in a way that makes sense for what it is that we want to create. If we don't do that, our designs end up feeling lopsided and our viewer's eye is going to end up getting stuck in the heavy areas. And viewers are impatient. They don't want to take the time to get out of the gravitational pull of one part and go to another part of your composition. So we have to help them do that. You can either increase visual weight in what you're creating um, or you can decrease it. And this allows you to equalize visual balance in a number of ways. I want to point out that this is especially important for asymmetrical compositions, which is in fact is what we'll be making for our next project. So these are the practical things that you as an artist can do to affect the visual weight. The first strategy for creating balance is to change the size of something in your composition. So for example, if you're using shapes, you can make them bigger if you need more visual weight, or you can make them smaller if you need less, as you see here on the screen. That big circle on the, on the left has much more visual weight than the little one on the right. The second thing you can do is you can change the number of things that you have in your composition, lines, shapes, forms, what have you. If you want to increase the visual weight, you use more things. If you want to reduce it, you use less things. So again, on the screen, the, the left-hand side has more visual weight because of the number than the right-hand side. The third strategy for creating balance is to change the intensity. So there are certain elements in art and design that are more intense. So for example, if you have two circles and one is gray and one is red, we consider the one that's brighter to be more intense. Likewise, deeper, darker values, rougher textures, more complex shapes. So for example, a star is considered more intense than a circle. Doing any of these things will make more visual weight than having something that's simpler or more muted. You can also change the direction of things. Diagonal lines, I think we talked about this with the last uh, unit, are kind of our party lines, uh, same for shapes and forms. Diagonals have more energy and therefore more visual weight than horizontals or verticals, so you can use them to uh, counterbalance something. Or if you want less visual weight, you can use horizontals and verticals. And then last but not least, you can change the placement of things. So line shapes and forms that are further from the center uh, especially in a 3D composition, if something's way out from the center, or in a 2D composition, if it's right at the edge, that'll increase the visual weight. People always think about the center as being the bullseye, and the, the exact center does have a certain degree of visual weight, but way out at the edge, our eye doesn't expect that, and it tends to get pulled out there uh, to things that are way on the edge or way uh, far away from the center. So again, the, the image on the screen, the side to the left, has these uh, circles way out towards the edge. The one on the right, they're all grouped in the center, and that has less visual weight. So the bottom line here is when you are working with asymmetrical compositions, 2D or 3D, what you need to do is mix and match those five methods for managing visual weight, can't talk all of a sudden, um, so that one side of your composition is equalized to the other side, even though they're different, they're asymmetrical, so different things are happening on each side, their overall visual weight feels the same. So on the screen, you see a composition, and what's happening here is that we have this large rectangle on the right. That's got a lot of visual weight because it's big. But we can balance that 
without making a big thing on the left. I mean, we could if we wanted to do symmetrical composition, have a big thing on the left, but we really just want to even it out while keeping it asymmetrical. So what you can do is you can have shapes towards the edge, like the black circle at the upper left. That will bring more visual weight to the side. Uh, the bright red circle is more intense. That will bring visual weight. The lines are diagonal and there are more of them. There are three versus one. That will create more visual weight. So you can do all or just a couple of those strategies to try to equalize things and keep an asymmetrical uh, composition feeling even. So here's an example of a sculpture. What does this sculptor do in order to, to, uh, to balance the visual weight even though it's asymmetrical? Well, there are a lot of answers that you could make here, but the shape on the right of the sculpture is a bit bigger. It has more visual weight because of its size, but you see the shape on the left is extended way out away from the center. It's further out towards the edge, and that has more visual pull even though that form is smaller. How about in this piece? It's an objective sculpture, so because we can tell what it is. So sometimes it's a little harder to get a handle on that. But on the left hand side, you have this very large figure. He's got a lot of mass to him. He's got a lot of visual weight. And then we've got the female figure on the right, who's a little bit more delicate. But she does have a lot more diagonals in her forms, which gives her a lot more energy and some, some more visual weight pulling your eye that way. She's also got more forms that extend further out from the center. And again, I just want to point out that dude's awesome beard. I love curly Q carving in stone. It's pretty amazing. All right, so here on the screen, you see one more sculpture, a little simpler one than the last two. Your task after watching this presentation is to respond to this assignment post and describe two ways in which this sculptor balances the very heavy visual weight on the left-hand side of the sculpture with whatever's going on on the right. So we've got this big form on the left. It's got a lot of visual weight. Somehow the sculpture balances out on the right. You're going to write down at least two ways he does that. You have to be specific, use one of those five strategies, talk about exactly what it is you think he does. There's more than one right answer here. You don't have to write at length, just a couple of sentences will do it and, and make a reply to this assignment post. And then you are good so far as this part of your attendance proportion goes. There are other attendance assignments this week, so make sure you check the assignments folder. Do you have any questions? If you do have questions about this presentation, feel free to ask me an in-person class. You can also email me and I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. I will see you in in-person class soon.